time with us today. I'm happy to have you here. Um, this is our wellness webinar. We have it every Thursday, at Capital Integrative Health. It's called Thriving Thursdays. And today we have a very special guest, Theodora Scarato, who's the Executive Director of Environmental Health Trust. And we're going to be talking today about a very interesting topic and I think um, very uh, controversial at times too, in terms of kind of what you hear in the media and in different places. But we're going to be examining the evidence and we're going to be looking at 5G, uh, 5G networks and human health. And I'm here co-led co today by EJ. EJ is our great PA here at Capital Integrated Health. And so EJ will be here as well. So great to see you, EJ, and great to see you and welcome Theodora. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Great. And so we're going to do a couple minutes of community updates. So we have a Facebook group. If you're into Facebook and wanted to go onto a private Facebook group, look at health and wellness topics, uh, including 5G. I think there's some topics on there too. But uh, we are going to be um, inviting you there. You can just go to, go to that link at the bottom and then we'll accept you into that group. So please join our grown community there if you're on Facebook. Um, we also have a brain health series that Jen and I are doing on anxiety, depression, and cognitive decline, which are all aspects of brain health. And, um, you know, how, how do we heal the brain, you know, especially during this challenging COVID time? We're doing this every Tuesday from 1 to 2 p.m. in the next few June Tuesdays. We also have at the end of the month a thyroid group visit backed by popular demand because I think some people missed the thyroid visit, so we're going to do that again. So there's an interest form in the chat box that Jen will put up there for the brain health series. We've already done gut and hormone, which are really great. Really had a good time there. Thank you so much for everyone that attended that. And I hope you can join the brain health series as well. And we're gonna repeat the gut and the hormone ones as well in the future. So up next in June, just a little preview, we are still working out for next week for June 3rd, but that'll be a nice surprise. That'll be a, a box of chocolates from a Forrest Gump, essentially. Um, we're also gonna have, this is very, I'm very excited about this, uh, Iris, who's a friend of ours, uh, who has a practice in Rockville that does reflexology. So um, we're gonna talk about that on June 10th and how that can really help your health and wellness. And then Jade and Shannon uh, of Kako Conscious Fame that you might've seen already before, they've done that one time here already at least, are gonna be uh, talking about and doing some yoga with us on June 17th, which is great. And then on June 24th, we're going to be having a special event. Um, EJ will be on there as well. Um, CIH reunions. We're going to have a lot of practitioners on there just so you can kind of meet, see people's faces again. You might not have seen people for like a year. And you can ask questions. You can chat about health, chat about wellness, chat about a new dog that we have. Uh, uh, CIH Panchito is great. Um, and he's training to be a rescue, uh, a rescue therapy dog, I believe is, is the right term. So a lot of, lot of good things there. It'll be like a, a virtual party. So uh, please uh, come to that, all invited to that. And today we're gonna to be talking to Theodora Scarato again, who has a wealth of knowledge on 5G and human health and is executive director of Environmental Health Trust. And uh, here's her bio, and there's a lot more probably to it than that, but the Environmental Health Trust is a scientific think tank, think tank that publishes research and educates policymakers on environmental health issues. And EHT scientists are among the leading independent voices calling for a halt on 5G, or at least an examination of the evidence. Um, Scarato, had, meaning Theodora, has published research on EMF policy and maintains the very famous EMF policy database at EHT and co-authored some uh, papers, white paper that talks about scientifically how government limits for wireless are not protective and lists best practices for reducing wireless in buildings. So I think whether or not you're concerned about 5G or not, definitely wireless technology is, is, um, you know, is here obviously already. Um, we wanna talk about how wireless technology in general affects health and what we can do to optimize your health in that setting. Um, let's see what else. Um, Theodora also coordinates scientific programs and develops awareness, uh, raising educational resources, which is part of what she's doing today. Uh, this is an educational program and discussion, and we'd love for you to chime in and what are your thoughts on 5G today and things like that and participate in this, that would be great. She's also lectured at the National Institutes of Health, the New Hampshire State 5G Commission, the University of California, San Francisco, and several international conferences, including the uh, the recent, um, I think there's, what was it called, EMR conference, EJ, I think? Yes, yep. Yeah. And then the website to learn more about Environmental Health Trust is eh, 
trust.org. So I think I will stop my share here and um, welcome Theodora officially to the wellness webinar. Thank you so much, Theodora, for coming today. Thank you so much uh, for having me. I'm really excited to be talking to everyone about this issue and I, I live in the community as well. So I will say that I, when I first learned about this, I'm a clinical social worker and I worked in a school uh, directing intensive therapy programs. And I learned about this and thought, eh, really? Could, could, could cell phone radiation, you know, it's not ionizing. The federal government says it's safe. Could this really be a problem? And when I started to learn about the research showing uh, brain damage to the developing brain, that's what got me hooked because I worked with so many kids who had prenatal exposures, um, as many of whom were adopted. And there's such a different clinical picture, you know, and it's a different treatment that you do when you're, there's brain damage compared to if there's uh, other issues going on in the family and so forth. So that got me on this issue about a decade ago. And I found myself deeper and deeper in, it, in and here I am. So one of the things that fascinated me, and I'm going to share my screen as well, was how other countries are just far ahead of the United States on this. So of a lot of the things I'm talking about are actually up on the websites of governments. So like France, uh, two years ago, issued recommendations, uh, not recommendations, it's the law, that when you buy a phone, it says in, in print so that you may see it, that it needs to be away from the pregnant abdomen and away from the abdomen of teenagers and that you shouldn't put it near your head. I mean, whereas in the United States, uh, these laws have been put forward in San Francisco and Berkeley and the wireless industry is so powerful. It makes the big tobacco look like a mom and pop shop that those laws have been, um, not an, not able to be implemented because of illegal uh, challenges by the wireless industry. They have very deep pockets. So let me just share my screen and I hope this work, uh, works so. So this is our website, Environmental Health Trust. And we were founded, just to tell you a little about our organization, um, by several founders, Dr. Ronald Herberman, who was one of the scientists who worked on natural killer cells for cancer. He also was the founding director of the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute, an NIH scientist. And he was the first, he headed up the first medical organization to issue recommendations on cell phones, telling his staff and, and, and uh, the doctors who worked under him that are, you know, worked on his, uh, in his institute to keep the phone away from their head and that they should teach their kids and their family about this. This is when cell phones were not used as they are now, right? That's 2008. And that made the New York Times, it made all the headlines. And uh, Dr. Deborah Davis, uh, who was the founding director of the Center for Environmental Oncology at the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute was working with him in developing those guidelines. And she also, she's our president, Dr. Herberman has passed away. Uh, Dr. Davis um, has, she was at National Academy of Sciences. She worked on climate change in the 80s and was one of the lead authors on the IPCC. And she also, um, she wrote these books, which I really recommend if you're interested in this issue, The Disconnect, The Truth About Cell Phone Radiation, where she details the science and stories of people who have been injured, stories of scientists and how the wireless industry has attacked them for the research that they put forward. And the secret history of the war on cancer, which is amazing. It's about um, pesticides and plastics and dyes and how all of these prevention efforts, these healthy living uh, ways of life that we know can promote a healthy brain and a healthy immune system um, have been not as prioritized, not prioritized at all. Instead, we're looking at treatments rather than prevention. So this is an amazing book. Um, and you can go online to learn more about our organization as well. Um, so just for folks who are in Montgomery County, um, and really, if you're in, in any other county, because this is happening all over, we do have a proposed bill moving forward right now 
is being voted on, it's going to allow uh, cell towers. They're called small cells, industry term. They call them small cells, not small cell towers, even though they're just shorter cell towers. And it will allow them 30 feet from homes. Now, you can replace your streetlight. The industry can come and get an application to replace a streetlight, make it higher and put antennas on top, or your utility pole and put antennas on top, and it will be by right, meaning the people are cut out of the decision-making process. We will not have a say in uh, even your local city will not be able to dictate where, what the process is. Instead, um, the county rules will apply and apparently there are many applications waiting in the wings for this to pass. It's been several years now that, that they've been working on this, raising it, and it's been halted. So I'll talk about that and some resources and groups that are working on that in the county. So my assumptions, and I know some of you on the call may be well-versed in this. Some people, this is new, a new information. But I really believe that, well, of course, they safety tested cell phones and wireless. And, and 5G, which is coming out now for long-term safety. Of, of course, I mean, how you couldn't roll this out without doing that. But actually the, D, the EPA was defunded and there's been no pre-market testing. There's no post-market surveillance. Uh, we don't even have experts in the United States government who are working on this issue, actively researching it and addressing whether the limits we have are safe or not, who are medical health and safety experts. We do have the National Toxicology Program doing research on it, which I'll talk about. However, the FDA and the FCC are stating that it doesn't apply to humans, even though they found clear evidence of cancer. So I also, um, so I talked about my assumptions that they're constantly researching. Um, and uh, and this, this I found quite shocking. I also, when I raised this issue, were thinking about that cell tower that, or those cell antennas, that might come in front of your home. You know, the question is, well, is it safe? Like, is it a safe level? It's so low, you know, it's much lower than what our government limits are is what we will be told when we raise this issue. But the science, the published peer reviewed science, as I'm gonna talk about, have found effects, harmful effects at levels much lower than our FCC limits. And if you look in history, and this is a picture from uh, Illinois, um, and there are many uh, here in, in Maryland, of course. Legal does not always mean safe, and the laws we have are from 1996, and they're not even based on federal agencies' development of safety standards. So with smoking, we had uh, doctors promoting safe cigarettes, DDT wallpaper, Sure, you've seen these images of spraying with DDT, the uh, heads of the tobacco industry raising their hand and saying that uh, they know that tobacco is not addictive and is not harmful. So here we are. Here is a picture of what I and I can tell you we are sent pictures. This was sent to me. Dear, you know, dear Environmental Health Trust, can you help me? This is outside of my window. And in Montgomery County, I should point out, it's not just the new ZTA that we are raising awareness on. And I, as a person who, a resident, am trying to um, raise awareness on, but also in our commercial and mixed commercial and residential areas and apartment buildings and so forth, we have uh, a, a law that is absolutely needs to be changed because it's allowing within 10 feet, 10 feet from structures, uh, cell antennas uh, in certain circumstances. There's a lot of loopholes in it. So I just wanted to show you some more pictures. So I know the word controversy is used and uh, this controversy has been fomented by industry that says, well, there's, there's many sides to the picture. However, there is what even the scientists who are calling for a halt to 5G, and I have here an image of the 5G appeal signed by over 250 scientists who published, and there's also the EMF uh, scientists appeal um, that are signed by scientists who published research in the field. They're calling for a moratorium on 5G. Um, they don't all agree on certain specifics, but they do agree on this, 
there are effects found at very, very low levels. I'm not talking about one tenth, not even one hundredth. I mean, 10,000 times lower. Like we're talking about a speed limit. It's like having a speed limit of, of 200 miles an hour and someone's going 100 miles an hour and you say, oh, well, that's, that's safe. It's only 100 miles an hour, but it, it, it's not near safe. Um, so uh, this has been shown in, in so many studies of which we have a compendium on our website. And just to review and touch on what research there is, there's cancer, which I am gonna talk about because back in 1996, when the United States adopted limits based on industry field groups, because the EPA was defunded from setting safety limits while they were in the midst of setting them, uh, the FDA asked the National Toxicology Program to do large scale animal studies. They did and they found clear evidence of cancer in the male rats. The same kind of cancer that people who use cell phones near their head and develop tumors near where the phones are, it's the same uh, cell, similar cell type between the rodents and the uh, humans have been found. And our scientists and uh, many other scientists are stating that the evidence is enough that radio frequency wireless radiation is a human carcinogen, but that's just one piece of it. There's research showing um, genetic impacts, DNA damage, memory damage, damage to reproduction, synergistic effects, meaning uh, the combination of one toxin or even ionizing radiation in combination with a non-ionizing radiation can promote uh, promote harmful effects, cancer and oxidative stress, headaches, uh, impacts to bees and insects and impacts to trees. And I think I talked about the, um, some of the studies, there was a, a kind of a review. Uh, it wasn't a systematic review. It was, a, it was a, just a calling for a look at this published in the Lancet that found most studies have demonstrated biological or health effects associated with exposure to anthropogenic electromagnetic fields. And one of the problems with you decide, okay, I'm gonna find out about this when you start going in the science is that there's so much industry funded science and those studies more often show no effect. In fact, it's about a 70-30 a split. So when industry funds science, they more often show no effect or it seems like they do from the abstract. It, they often are designed to compare to FCC limits or to do very short-term studies rather than long-term studies. Whereas when it's, not, when it's independently funded, they more often show an effect. Here's some examples of what 5G is gonna mean. It's going to mean cell antennas closer to people than ever before and literally, and this is the FCC saying it, 800,000 new uh, installations in the United States. We're talking about millions of antennas because each installation can have numerous antennas on them. This is in Ohio, someone sent me a picture. Um, so I'm gonna, I know there's a lot of questions, but I wanted to just share a few things before I hopped into there. The short story, and I think I talked about it, is that the EPA was defunded. And what you see here is the last uh, report that they did on the biological effects of radio frequency radiation from the 80s. And when I wrote the EPA recently, asking them to, you know, so I could, we could get on paper, when did they last look at this issue? They stated it was in 19, um, the mid 80s when they did this report that they looked at the issue and they, they're defunded. Now, this is Dr. Ronald Melnick. He's one of our scientific advisors. You can go online, you can watch him talk. He is a National Institutes of Health scientist, now retired, who, is, uh, who led the NTP st animal study on long-term exposure to wireless radiation. And here's his final remarks. Uh, this was at um, the Michigan State House. I presented, Dr. Davis presented many. You can watch the whole talk if you want to watch eight hours of conversation on 5G. And this is about one minute of him, the end of his talk, where he describes how they found that long-term exposure led to uh, cancer in the animals. Because of the widespread use of cell phones, uh, okay. because of the widespread use of cell phones, 
uh, even a small increase in risk would have a serious public health impact. And in the meantime, rather than telling people, if you are concerned, this is what you can do, the health agencies need to promote precautionary measures, especially for children and women, because in children, the risks could be greater due to the increased penetration, as well as the sensitivity of the developing brain to uh, da tissue damaging agents. So finally, what is the lesson learned? We should no longer assume that any current or future wireless technology, including 5G, is safe without adequate testing, because to not do so is not ethical. And I'm so thankful that he has been speaking out on this issue. Um, he talks about the study, how it was designed, how the critiques of the study are do not apply um, because there are industry groups. There's a group called the International Commission for Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection that sounds so fancy. Like if, if that group tells you something, it seems like they would know what they're talking about. But in fact, they're a small invite only club uh, created with a man who has funneled money. It's a long sorted story, but long story short, um, that group is saying that the NTP study doesn't apply to what we should think about with humans. And Dr. Melnick has really been showing the data and documenting how that isn't so. Dr. Linda Birnbaum, the former uh, director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and the National Toxicology Program who just retired over a year ago now is also speaking out on this issue. And she just penned a letter, uh, two letters, one to the Italian government telling them that they should keep their more protective limits. Many countries in Europe have more protective limits than the United States. We allow from cell towers among the highest levels of radiation compared to many other countries. And if you go to the National Toxicology Program, there is a fact sheet on the NTP study um, we're addressing some of, I, <laughs> there's some changes that are happening on our federal government websites, especially over the last few years, which have downplayed the issue, but the NTP study is shared on the NTP page. The FDA states that this study is, has a lot of, uh, reasons that we shouldn't be too concerned about it, FYI. So we can think about cell phones and wireless as smoking. There's first hand, second hand, and third hand. Uh, first is the device near your body. You're gonna get the most intense exposure into your body uh, with when you put a device near your, near your head or, or your chest. There's second hand if you're near uh, a device that's a personal device in use. And then third hand where you have the antennas, which is more ambient environmental levels. Um, I think we're, I actually can't read the chat, I should tell you, uh, Dr. Wong, so if you can interject if there's something, because I'm doing this screen share this way. I wanted to also share with you Dr. Hugh Taylor, who is um, a, he's at Yale Medicine, he's the chief of obstetrics, and he did studies where he put mice, pregnant mice in a cage, and had a, cell, a transmitting cell phone, and then took a look at the offspring of the mice and found damaged memory and hyperactivity in the animals. This is one of many studies on animals. However, this has led to uh, a project called the Baby Safe Project, but I wanted to play a short clip of him speaking about his research. This is why I think this issue is so important. The fetus is perhaps the most vulnerable to these types of insults. When the brain is just forming, we are perhaps at our most vulnerable stage. So this is a study that really looked at only the effect of prenatal exposure to cell phone radiation. What effect uh, does having a cell phone near your baby when you're pregnant have on that baby later on in life when that baby's grown up? We tested these mice when they reached adulthood and uh, looked at the lasting effect of that early prenatal cell phone exposure. The mice who were exposed to cell phones were more hyperactive. They were running around the cage a lot more aggressively. They had poorer memory. Um, they couldn't remember objects in the cage uh, as well as their counterparts who weren't exposed to the cell phone radiation. 
uh, but they did not have any increased anxiety. Sometimes running around can be a sign of anxiety. It was not that. They were calm and relaxed. So they were running around these cages, bouncing off the walls, not a care in the world. Something that in our eyes resembles attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in children. Um, that was the closest model we can think of to the behavioral effects that we saw in the mice. When I first saw Hugh Taylor's study, I was uh, thrilled and really deeply concerned because I was aware of research earlier looking at what happens inside the brain. And if you look at something called the dentate gyrus, which occurs here and, and is quite critical to where the brain cells form for thinking and learning, you can see that prenatally exposed rats develop smaller brains with more brain damage. The brain is tremendously resilient, but when there's so many environmental insults at once, the circuitry in the brain becomes overwhelmed. And unlike what we have in our electrical wiring in homes, where there's a circuit breaker that can stop the electrical flow before it causes damage, the brain doesn't have that same capacity. And so environmental insults, when they add up, the circuitry is especially important. So Dr. Hugh Taylor and um, many other health professionals and educators are a part of the BabySafe project, which has resources for pregnant women about how to reduce exposure to cell phone and wireless radiation. And they have tips. They have a really nice um, printable materials as well so that just educating, keep the phone away from your head, um, avoid ho holding a wireless device against your body when in use. And I can say that I did not know about this issue till my kids were, my oldest was 10, so I had an eight-year-old and a 10-year-old. And um, something I would do is take the cell phone and put it in my baby's sling, or, um, you know, I didn't know about this issue at all. And I'm thankful that they're getting the word out on this, because right now, you know, wireless devices are proliferating like never before. I mean, we didn't, I, I think most of the people on the call remember like, when they got their first cell phone, whereas kids and are being exposed from before they're born. And this is unprecedented. And we don't even have the, the human information to even know what the, the, the long-term effects will be in full. What we do know is that children are more vulnerable. The radiation uh, and I'm showing you a phone to the head, but I'll also show you a cell tower as well. Their children's brains and bodies are more exposed. They, it, they absorb proportionally more radio frequency radiation than adults. It goes deeper in their bodies. They have more water in their tissue. They have thinner skulls. Uh, they have um, smaller arms, so they hold their devices closer than a, an adult does. And there's this is research that, um, that we have been a part of publishing. It's engineering computer simulations, uh, very sophisticated actually. The FDA uses this to test their radiation devices, but not cell phones, which is really interesting. Um, and they sh this color, the white to the yellow, to the orange, to the red, to the purple shows the intensity of the radiation into the tissue. And you can see in a child, there's more areas that are lighter colors. Um, and there's research showing damaged memory, uh, damage to memory in kids who hold cell phones to their heads. Um, I talked about the Yale studies, all of this we have online, uh, behavioral problems after prenatal use. And this is an image from the European Commission research called SeaWind, where they did a far field antenna, much like a cell antenna, a base station. So in a distance where you're gonna get a full body exposure, and you can see the same colors here uh, in terms of just thinking about how the lighter colors represent the higher intensity into uh, the area that they're looking at. And children are more exposed. So this is why we're working so hard on this. The United States, as I talked about, has among the highest allowable exposure limits when it comes to cell towers. And there are many countries that allow much less. It does not mean those countries are protective because it's still not fully protective, but it is um, sometimes a hundred times less radiation from cell towers compared to the United States. What's happened is with 5G, 
the companies need to get those countries to change their laws because there's going to be so many antennas and they are going to be closer to people. They are trying to get countries that have more protective limits to accommodate the increased radiation exposure from 5G. So they were recently successful with Lithuania and Poland, actually, and they're working very hard on Italy right now, although there was there's a lot there's 600 cities that have uh, the mayors and the elected officials have called to halt 5G. This is a paper, oops, um, evaluating all of the science on cancer and which has determined that the evidence shows that radio frequency would be classified as a human carcinogen if the International Agency for the Research on Cancer would be to meet again to look at this issue. They last looked at it in 2011. They've been advised by their committee to relook at it, and we believe it will happen in the next five years. There is research showing um, increased uh, damage, blood brain barrier permeability, which could allow more toxins, which are circulating in your in your blood to reach your brain. When it comes to um, what is the U.S. government doing, uh, there is no research that industry that we know of is doing to to look at what the long term effect of 5G would be, because 5G is going to mean more of what we have, more of the uh, current frequencies that are in use, in addition to higher frequencies that have never been publicly used so commercially as they are now. And this is from a Senate hearing where Senator Blumenthal is asking industry about what science exists in terms of safety. And so there really is no research ongoing. We're kind of flying blind here so far as health and safety is concerned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What happens when thousands of these cells begin appearing near schools, community centers, homes, and workplaces. And what happens to the workers who are up there repairing them? What happens to the folks who are walking by them every day, school children, and the younger the children, the more susceptible to the radio frequencies they may be? I didn't realize what clip I had up there. That was the press conference that he had uh, clipped with the Senate hearing. So in the press conference, which is an hour and really is pretty incredible, um, there's talks by a union representative of folks who work, uh, workers for uh, communications workers, as well as uh, Blake Levitt, who's a journalist who's been working on this for a while and for many decades, actually. And uh, Senator Blumenthal wrote a letter asking for the data on health and safety to the government. And that was part of the press conference. So what's happening uh, in, in um, Maryland, in Montgomery County, this is, for those of you who live in Montgomery County and want to do something about this new um, uh, proposed bill, there is actionnetwork.org. There's a letter writing campaign and there are these groups, MoCo Safety, TechWise MoCo MD, Montgomery County Coalition to Protect Neighborhoods and Montgomery County Coalition for the Control of Cell Towers, MC4T, which have uh, action steps and there's letter writing campaign as well. And you can go learn more at our organization. We have a newsletter and we have a lot of resources about how to reduce exposure. Um, so that you can learn what you can do to reduce exposure to your personal uh, personal wireless radio frequency radiation exposures. However, when it comes to cell towers, we will not have a choice about how we can reduce that exposure because it will be outside and everywhere and increasing. So 5G also means billions of new wireless connected devices a lot of which are for industry, for companies. It's not even things our phone's gonna do. And it's not about better voice service. So if you don't have good service in your home, it may not necessarily affect that uh, for, for many reasons, which is a, I can talk about, but it's really about faster downloads and video and technical specifications for networks that we can only dream of right now. Industry is trying to create those highways so they can put their infrastructure where they want without people and people's rules or 
you know, city's rules getting in the way. So uh, there's a lot to talk about. Um, I guess I should take questions and I couldn't read the chat while I was in the share. So um, thank you where so should much. I start? <laughs> thank you so much, Theodore. This is absolutely amazing. I know this is a topic that I've been interested in for a while and have brought to our clinic and I'm trying to get our providers, you know, talking about it with patients and we've definitely started doing some of that. Um, I do I a couple of questions that I just wanted to kind of talk about. So can you just tell us, you know, how does 5G work exactly? And how does that differ from the technologies that we have right now, the 4G and the 3G technologies that have been around? Okay, good question. So 5G is not, is going to be numerous frequencies, both low band, mid band and high band and frequencies that are newly coming on to be available to the commercial market. So submillimeter and millimeter waves are going to be part of 5G if we talk about frequencies. However, the biological impact, like what makes, why is this harmful to our bodies? Because we've had um, electromagnetic fields, there's many natural sources of, of electromagnetic radiation. Um, it's because the scientists are saying there's a the modulation it, the, this is data moving through the air, it's invisible, but it's, it's data, it's data packets on the frequencies. So it's actually a little more complicated than just the frequency. Um, it's also going to be not just, a lot of people talk about, well, we have to have all these antennas because the, it doesn't reach far. Because there's gonna be so many different networks any phone, I don't even know if this is a phone or not, it's, I use this in, when I give talks, I think it's an iPad, but let's pretend it's a phone, is going to have a uh, 5G antenna, 4G antennas, Wi-Fi antennas, Bluetooth, and, and other, other antennas, numerous antennas. So when you're near a 5G antenna and that's the best signal, it'll use the 5G network, which could be all different frequencies. When, then it'll drop to 4G. When, so there's all these different things going on as part of the 5G, what industry terms, ecosystem. There's going to be a very high data rate, which has been implicated in more impacts to our biology. Dr. Igor Belyaev has published uh, many papers on this, and we have that on our website. I put it in the chat. I'll put a link to our, a page that has science, and you can look at his research um, and, and other, other scientists research where they talk about, um, let me just do science on 5G, um, how the data rate is important because with all of these billions of new things and all of these new networks, there's just gonna be more information moving wirelessly through the air and it's being absorbed into our body. And with the, with the small cells that are gonna, that we're seeing placed you know, around Montgomery County, are, is there a way to know like what, is that a 5G, is that 4G? Like, is there a way to know what that is exactly? Well, that's a very important question because one of the things that's happened is people are in the dark about what it is. You mm -hmm. know, we, we buy food and there's, we know what's in the food, right? Well, to a degree, and there are labeling. We believe there needs to be more transparency so that you're not asking me that question. Why don't we know? Well, you have to ask, you have to con contact the landowner who might be the city or the county or the state, depending on the land where it is, or it might even be PEPCO if it's a PEPCO utility pool and get the permits and the uh, spe technical specifications to even know what it is. And this is outrageous. Why don't we know, you know, what, what is coming out of, of that antenna? What are the frequencies? What, what is it even for? Is it for my phone or is it for some other security network or networks that don't even apply to, to me? Sometimes companies use their uh, small cells to basically move signal to kind of make, so it's not clogged up. Think of it like a highway where there's traffic. They don't want a lot of traffic on the roads. They want to have enough roads so that there's not traffic. So sometimes they move it along a way where, where you're actually affecting communities, but it's not even for those communities. So in some places they've asked for signs that say, 
you know, radio frequency radiation is emitted. And I was just in DC um, and Capitol Hill actually. And my friend goes, look at that. We look up, oh, I wish I had the picture. Uh, and, and there's a sign, it's so far up, you can't even read it. It's, it, but it did say, I know what it said, cause I know the sign, but no one in their right mind could have read what it said. But um, we need to know. And in Montgomery County, you can go to different maps. I can put links in the chat where you can find out what the proposed, what's being proposed or has been proposed in the past to learn more. There's also a tower committee in Montgomery County that has proposals. However, um, it's a broken process uh, in terms of how, there's a lot of rubber stamping going on in the county okay. related to these. Okay. I'll put a link in the chat. Oh, thank you so much. And in relation to, I think one of the big questions that we're getting right now is how to protect ourselves from radio frequencies, 5G. Um, I would love to hear like, you know, your top things when you think about what people can do to reduce their exposures. So I'll talk, so first I wanna say, I can talk about how to reduce your personal exposures and these are very important. Mm -hmm. However, you won't be able to fix the cell tower outside of your house. So it's really important to get to, you know, the personal is the political to get involved and talk to the decision makers and let them know about this issue because they're, they're making those decisions. So I, I, for example, um, if you have a cell phone, you don't wanna put it to your head. I'm gonna talk about reducing exposure. You, you wanna have it on speaker and at a distance. Now there's another trick um, in our, and I, oh, and use a corded phone whenever you can. A corded phone. We, we have a corded phone here. I, I am on the phone and on the computer all the time. I, I use that as much as possible. And um, we don't have a copper landline. You can't get it in Montgomery County, I don't think, anymore when you move. I've moved three times and no more can I get it. So we have a modem where we ran the line. Uh, that's one important thing. If, you, if you're in, in a place where you can have access to an ethernet, which, um, which I should have brought in, I have it, but I'll unhook myself. So I'm not gonna unhook myself. Um, with an ethernet cord, you actually can, like let's say you have a modem, you can run an ethernet from it and get a special adapter that goes on and you can do a lot of things with your cell phone, like uh, a lot of applications without having all the antennas on. So on your phone, you have Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, location, all these antennas. Another thing you can do is turn off the antennas you're not using when you're not using them. So why have the cellular on if you're somewhere where you're only using the Wi-Fi, for example? Not that Wi-Fi is uh, safe, so I'm gonna talk about that because but I'm talking about reducing. There's so much we can do to reduce. Turn it off when you're not in use, don't sleep with it. The first thing that, that we did was at night, turn, don't sleep with the phone on near your head. And how many people sleep with the phone on near the head? I, as a social worker, I remember when my clients had some crises going on, hospitalizations, and. I had the phone literally on my head at night because I didn't want my husband to be woken up and I needed to deal with, um, you know, me medical hospitalizations and so forth. And, um, you know, have it forwarded to your home phone or put it um, at, if you have to be on call, you know, the first thing until you set it up, I would say is have it at a distance, not, not near yourself. And then if you can get a hookup or UMA, I don't know if you know what UMA is. Mm -hmm. There are these um, voice over IP things that you can connect to your router so that you can have a telephone system in your home. You can forward your cell phone to that landline, for, for example. Turn off the wireless at night. Turn it off when you're not using it. That's like the first low hanging fruit, easy to start with. Um, use corded connections for your internet if you're, especially if you're in a fixed location like I am in my office, I use an ethernet cord. It's faster, safer, more secure. My Zoom calls don't drop. You'll find with Wi-Fi, when you have four people on Wi-Fi at a time, there's problems with connection. And it, it's, it's, it won't happen if you're ethernet connected. So um, be aware that Alexa, and these speaker things, uh, what are they called? Um, 
uh, wireless speaker. Thing. Oh, 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 like a Bluetooth speaker. Yeah, but also um, they talk to you. They are like uh, they these things you talk to. They're these tube things, and you talk to them. Alexa, mm -hmm. Amazon, something or app. Do you know what I'm talking about? And they yeah. speak. You say hi, Alexa. I want this, and then it tells you something. Yeah. Those things emit radiation, and I I would love for someone to start a campaign just saying, hey, we want we want that, even though they spy on you. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a maybe a time and place for it if you choose to and you, you don't choose to but could you please make it so i can plug it in yeah. does it have to be wireless yeah. so all of these things could be not wireless so i would say using wired connections keeping the phone away from your body if you have to carry it don't put it in your bra don't put it in your pants unless it's powered off uh get yourself a meter if you want to measure and um those are my top recommendations we have a lot of um yeah eht has a ton of resources printouts great things that you can utilize yeah on how to produce and we also have how to minimize health risks from wireless devices from the new jersey educational association and there's a lot of tips and tricks then some of them are super easy just to start you know the problem is that with 5g it's going to be increasingly impossible to, uh, to, to, you know, to keep your levels down. And there really is a difference in Montgomery County. I have a meter, so I can go around and I can measure places. And there's such a difference in communities, depending on how many antennas there are or not. There's apartment buildings that have antennas on the top, and people don't even know about that. And we need to be measuring. We need to know what the levels are. And the US government is not doing that. They're not taking regular measurements of the communities to even know what we, we have. Theodore, I think you said there was some, I, I, I remember talking with you before this talk today on how there's a discrepancy, right? Between different different communities in terms of what where the wires are and things like that. Is that is that true in Montgomery County? A discrepancy between uh, I'm sorry in terms of the exposure like I, I thought there were some more towers and places that maybe they they weren't being listened to or something or you know it might have to do with uh kind of where people live and things I'm not sure well there are cell towers placed on schools in Montgomery County more often placed on schools that have been identified as those with more uh, minority populations and more kids with that's what it was that's what it was yeah and so in when when cell towers are proposed to be in wealthier areas or on the W schools as they're called there is an en mass massive opposition that's formed you can look up Wooten cell tower meeting and see uh, some of that. You can go to Parents Coalition and see many of those meetings, look up cell towers. And Montgomery County used to, well, there's a lot going on in Montgomery County with cell towers, but they state they have a policy not to put cell towers on elementary schools anymore mm -hmm. since there's been so much outcry on the issue. Um, and I've been in many meetings related to cell towers in, in Montgomery County and, um, you know, it just comes back to the FCC limits. The, the, the person trying to put the cell towers up says, well, we have FCC limits. So, you know, they say that these are safe. Well, Montgomery County actually started a lawsuit against the FCC uh, several years ago saying, how can you be forcing these cell towers in our communities when your limits are from 1996? Now, what ended up happening was the FCC then made a decision, and I think partially due to that lawsuit, because they would have lost. I mean, it was a very good suit that Montgomery County, Montgomery County did, uh, said, well, we made a decision and we looked at the science that's on the record that our scientists and many others submitted thousands of pieces of paper uh, related to. Over, I think there's over 2000 submissions and we don't think we need to change our 1996 limits. So Montgomery County's case was considered moot. And then our organization, Environmental Health Trust and Children's Health Defense and a total of 14 petitioners have now done a new uh, legal action against the FCC, challenging them that they actually looked at the record 
that's part of it. It's actually several laws that we're alleging that they we believe they have absolutely violated because they ignored the science. And our our case is uh, awaiting a decision. We had oral argument in January, and the Court of Appeals in Washington D.C., the federal court, they these judges asked very pointed questions of the FCC. They were like, "Well, what about what about you know iPads and kids on iPads all day long?" How do you know it's safe? Did you, where is the, where is the science? You're saying that there's no problem, but where, where's the documentation on that? And the FCC was really unable to provide that documentation from the record that they'd looked at. So we're hopeful, but you know, we don't know how this case will go, but the mm -hmm. reality is the limits have, were from 1996. Yeah, so so I, I and and I mean this might be hard to predict, but in terms of Montgomery County, since we're in Montgomery County here, um, what do you feel in terms of the prognosis, so to speak, or the uh, the outlook for for five G versus not, you know, in terms of that bill? Uh, but what do you think the outlook is there? Uh, I'm going to be honest and say, unless people that people have to get organized on this. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I would like to tell you I'm optimistic. I mean, I'm always optimistic, but what's happened with COVID and with the way things have changed over the last few years, because we're not getting together. We don't yeah, have meetings yeah. where we can be together. People are more in their silos. Yep. And every homeowners association, every, every group needs to be made aware. Like people don't even know the bill is proposed. So right. they need to know what's out there. The California Sierra Club, Washington DC Sierra Club, have and, and in the past, the Montgomery County Sierra Club have written opposition to similar bills. The um, uh, 350 in Montgomery County also wrote in opposition. And most people aren't aware of all of this because climate impacts, which I haven't even talked about, have not been considered because 5G is an energy hog. We have all kinds of resources on that on our website, but it's there's a lot of reasons why people might wanna be engaged. And it's really important to get educated on this. So in Montgomery County, I'll put a link to those sites as well so that you have them into the Action Network page. Um, I think it's an all hands on deck situation. I have heard from people that, um, let me just send the chat, uh, that our, our council people, you know, they need to hear from us. Yes, this is an actionnetwork.org letter link that I have signed as well. Um, I, I do think that the precautionary principle that we can apply to tobacco, it can apply to, you know, different toxins, you know, environmental, um, you know, I guess uh, EMR, you know, is, is an environmental toxin as well. And, and I think that, uh, I think you did address the uh, point of, of justice, uh, I, I think, because we had talked about that on Facebook and, um, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that we address that, but I think this idea that that we need it for, you know, we need 5G for to get the internet to everyone is not not completely true. Is that correct? I, I just want to address that. It's it's being used. You'll hear, oh, this is to bridge the digital divide, but there is no guarantee that um, communities are going to be more connected with the laws that that are being proposed. That's not in place. In fact, when we've looked into this, um, what, what we need in Montgomery County is a needs assessment. There are many situations, and we need affordability mm -hmm. and accessibility, which are not coming from this law of putting the cell tower there for, for many reasons. So take um, one- it, it absolutely is important to make sure that everyone has access to yes. you know, digital technology. I think we all agree on that. Um, there's probably you know, different ways to do that. And I think that is a, another important issue you know this this i don't think they're mutually exclusive though basically um yeah so you put a bunch of links on here thank you so much theodore for that um different coalitions yeah oh, these are great i um, mean yeah get together in your neighborhoods um listening today um and then and then it looks like yeah, mc4t.org okay uh, montgomery county coalition for the control of cell towers joe joe was mentioning that in her community in dc um, back in 2006, she had stopped. She had helped us to stop a a tower being put up. Um, I guess a cell tower that's that was very close to nursery schools and elementary schools and things like that. So they actually were able to um, stop that at that time. Um, 
you know, probably getting together with with all of her friends and neighbors. So that's a good point, Joe. Um, what it okay? So there's a bunch of indiv individual questions that I think you may have answered some already, but uh, let me just go to this one. Um, why not? Why not locate? Why why is there not a location map? I mean, it's a good idea of frequency levels in Montgomery County. Would that be uh, easy? Would that be technically possible to do? Or a location map of frequencies? I guess frequency. Yeah. Does that mean? I guess that would mean like where are the five Gs right now? Maybe is, is that what that means? Well, you know, <laughs> there should be something that is technically correct. Right now, what you can do, and you can watch Rick Myers, uh, he did a video, a webinar, which is on the coalition website, which I'll put up after I uh, talk about this briefly. But if you go to like Verizon or T-Mobile and you, they have these coverage maps and you can click on them and you'd think 5G was everywhere, the way their maps seem to show that we already have it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's because they're using the word 5G and really it's sort of a a pre 5G or a, it, it depends on the companies are using 5G in many different ways. And actually mm -hmm. there's been some legal action about that happening. So there should, that should be, I mean, we need transparency in what we're being, what we have. And, and something else I'm asking the county council for is, um, and, and other people are, is measurements pre and post that are real time measurements. Also having those uh, understandable in English, not legalese, not, mm -hmm. not engineering specific, like what are the levels in the community? If you lived in France, you could go to your mayor and say, I like to know what, what is the level of wire of radio frequency radiation from the cell tower networks? And they would have to get it to you. And there are coverage maps where you can go online and see what's where and what the levels are. They, okay. so they could do it. They could do it. Okay, do it. that's good. Or I guess you could buy one of the RF meters that, that you have. Um, yeah. Christine asked about protective phone cases. I think I have one from, I think it's Safe Sleeve. EJ, do, do you know about the protective phone cases? Um, so what I always recommend with any type of protective gear is to measure before and after to actually to measure, know yeah. for sure. Mm -hmm. um, Theodore, I don't know if you have any other ways of knowing, you know, there's a lot of products out there that claim to be, you know, reduce RF exposure, EMFs. Um, I don't know if you have any good ways of knowing what's good and what's not. You know, we really need, another thing that we need is uh, standardized testing. Yeah, so that if, if the government recognized that this was an issue, then there would be a standardized protocol just mm -hmm. like we measure pesticides. Basically, we need a functional medicine approach to uh, 5G <laughs> as well. <laughs> Test, yeah. don't guess. Well, um, one thing I want to mention as an actionable item for everyone, as long as you can avoid the cicadas stepping on them, is that earthing is a way to get natural antioxidants in your feet. If you wear cotton socks, or if you're barefoot, you're out in the earth, that actually can provide some relief against the oxidative stress from from using the, the cell phones or computers too much, which we probably are doing all too much now with COVID. But, um, but it, is, it is important to know that there's certain things you can do to increase the ability of your body to detoxify from various toxins. So I, I think, you know, we can cover this in different um, webinars and talks, but typically we think about, you know, eating a, eating a good nutrition plan, you know, even having good uh, whole foods, you know, things like that, lots of fruits and vegetables. Um, getting enough sleep, you know, managing stress, all these things are helpful for detoxification. Certain, uh, certain compounds that your body makes and you can also get in supplement form. I think glutathione would be, glutathione would be one or what is called N-acetylcysteine. So I just, I just want to offer that to people that are listening just in case you're like, what do I do? What do we do about this? And I, I think the avoidance thing, Darcy did bring up this great point about, you know, getting off the, the phones, you know, putting them on, on airplane mode. I think that's a big thing, especially when you're sleeping. So that, that is good. Um, uh, what do you think about headphones? Uh, I guess, I mean, these are fine, right? If, if we put these on our cell phone, I mean, that's not, that's not yeah. increasing the... Well, let me just mention glutathione. So there's research that shows decreases in glutathione from electromagnetic radiation yes. exposure. Right. So all of these, I guess you, you'll talk about this in another talk, but there's so much that we can do to promote... So we all need glutathione. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, but right. so with headphones, earbuds don't use wireless earbuds because they actually, one, 
connect yeah. to the other one and then it connects to the phone. So you yeah, so, so the Bluetooth is not good, y'all, everyone. That's, that, that definitely don't do the Bluetooth, yeah. Yeah, so, and there's three okay. kinds of Bluetooth and earbuds, earbuds or the, the Apple ones, they are the highest level of radiation Bluetooth. And we have mm. a section on our website on that. How to get those out of our teenagers' heads is a, is a question mm. of, of importance. They, so, they look yeah. cool, but not good for you, right? Yeah. Basically. Okay. So um, if you use wired, we actually, we recommend air tube. Air uh, tube, wire, okay. Air tube so that the, if you were gonna use a wired one or there's this little, so different ones are different. The, sometimes there can be some electricity that can travel up and you, there's also something called a ferret bead you can put on the end, but okay. uh, you know, air tube headsets, um, anything just not, it, near the head, the head's the highest. So you want it away from the head. And if you have it on the headset, like you do now, don't put the phone on your body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the young women who are putting the phone in their bra there, mm -hmm. um, who've developed tumors in there directly underneath where the phone was placed in their bra and their unusual tumors, they're not normal, uh, breast cancer presentations. They are unusual tumors. Um, you can read about that on our website, uh, Dr. West, who's a breast cancer specialist, talks about the case study he put forward. But a lot of those women talk, tell their stories. They have the phone and they use their Bluetooth or a wire and they mm -hmm. just were talking all day on the car. And yep. also you don't want to use the phone. I hate to say this because I use the phone in the car like all the time. I drive to work like this. 24 hours in a day, right? You have to do yeah. that. <laughs> and a car is the worst place for, for a phone because mm -hmm. the, the phone is switching from tower to tower and it goes to high. It jumps up, right. handshakes. So um, it's better to have, I do know some testing shows much lower with the Bluetooth, even though it's Bluetooth, I'm not recommending it. I'm saying it's lower than phone to the head. Okay. There used to be ways you can get, we're asking car companies to have that antenna outside. The antenna shouldn't be inside, it should be outside. Mm, oh, that's a good, yeah, just like good you idea. Have your system. And there are some cars that do that. So okay. it really depends. Um, and Jack says, this has been amazing and very interesting information that we should all be more aware of. And, and I would add to that, and I echo Jack, and thank you, Jack, for that comment. Thank you, Darcy. And thank you, everyone, for all your comments and particip participation. Also, you know, what can we do to take action on it? So, you know, go to some of these websites that Theodore has put up, take action, you know, write a letter to your council member and uh, just get more aware of this. So you can talk to your friends and family about it because it is a health issue and we do want to have a balanced approach to it, which I think hopefully we offer here today. And thank you so much, EJ, for being on, uh, co-leading this here. EJ is our resident expert in uh, 5G as well as many EMF topics. And thank you so much, Theodore. It's been such a pleasure and uh, hope to talk to you soon. So thank you so much for being on today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. All right. Have a good rest of the day. Uh, get outside, get some earthing and uh, enjoy the cicadas, everyone. We'll see you later. Have a great Memorial Day and we will see you in um, next week then. Thank you so much.